Do this. You want to um, send a maximum flow. Constraints, of course. Uh, the constraints are defined by the uh, the age weights. So uh, here are the age weights. Three, four, four, ten, two, one, one, five, again. So the classical example of this maximum, maximum flow problem is that you can think of each of the nodes in the graph being a city, okay? And they're connected by these pipes. And you have bigger pipes and small pipes. You want to send either oil or water uh, from one city to another city, right? In this case, you want to send oil from as this might be located in down there in Texas, right? Mm. And uh, we need to have oil sent it over to Washington DC at this T. And you have all these connections. These connections are um, the capacities, right? In this case, um, a connecting from D to C is going to be a really tiny pipe, really thin, right? So the capacity is only one. Uh, the connection between B and A is much bigger, uh, capacity 10. So you want to be able to send the flow, the maximum flow, right, defined by uh, all of these capacities. And um, so you're going to have constraints. The constraints are going to be constrained by the capacity. So think about both of these definitions. So on the left, you have linear programming, right? On the right, you have maximum flow problem. Black. So on the right. Have maximum flow. Okay. So the goal here is to maximize. that we have also a bunch of variables. So I guess the most basic uh, formulation of all this is how would you define variable? What are the variables here? What are the, ver what are the variables in your maximum flow problem? The quantity of water perhaps? Uh, yeah. No? Yeah, it is. But where? You're talking about the quantity of water of coming out from S? Yeah, if, if that's where you're trying to send the water from. Yeah. Over where? T, right? Maybe. Well, we're, we're trying to send it to T, but S can only be sent to the neighbors. Oh, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. So, so the entire graph needs to be flooded with the flow that's going to be sent out from S. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Right? So, huh. Um, so the variables are actually the amount of flow that will be sending out for every single age. Okay, so each of the age is going to be um, contains a variable x. Well, in this case, let's just say this is x zero, 
x1, x2, right? And we can label every single age with a variable. So this is the uh, flow that we're going to send over, right? In this case, the flow from C to E will be, um, oh, how come we have, oh, this is seven, sorry, I thought this is one. <laughs> it's going to be defined by um, this X7, right? The, among the flow coming from C going to E, okay? So once we have this, so let's say, So this is a number, right? A number that will be sending over from the source to the destination. So that would be x So now, what is the objective function that you try to define? You, know, you try to maximize the flow, right? From S to D. Well, at least this should be coming from S. And if you look at all the ages coming out from S, right, you try to maximize what? The flow. Well, right? Yes. <laughs> but we define the variables. We have to we have to write it down as variables. Oh, okay. So it's going to be the summation of the flow from S to C, from S to B, from S to A, right? So it's a summation of X0 to X3. Right, so that's that objective function that we try to we try to maximize to, uh, to optimize. What are the constraints? The edge weights. Yeah, the weights, the capacity. Your flow cannot be um, exceeding the um, the capacity, right? So tell me what they are. Uh, four, x four zero, x four x zero, and four. then three and three. Hold on, let me write that. I'm not going to write all of them. <laughs> Too many. So you, you, so basically, this is the first constraint, right? C capacity. Oh, come on, let me write two at least. X one or equal to smaller than or equal to three, all the way to X ten, smaller than or equal to five. Start from the capacity. Capacity constraint. Right. Anything else? Is, is it one directional, the capacity? Well, the ages are directional. Yeah, but it's not dual directional. Well, the ages are directional. Oh, the, okay, I actually so see the other. The flow flow in one direction. direction. Yeah. Yeah. So you can only send four units yeah. of whatever from S to C. Right. Okay, no more. You can send one, you can send zero. It's your decision. But you can't send the flow back to S? Mm, no. Okay. No, okay. Do that. Just sure. I, I just mentioned another constraint. Your flow cannot be negative, right? So, um, for example, for all of this, we have xi greater than or equal to zero. That's another constraint. Another constraint that's really important is that whatever that's sent out by S, right? When it, when, when it will, whatever, how much oil was pumped out from S, they all need to be received by T. So what does that mean? S is equal to T? X, 
And then, so we got x zero, uh, x nine, and x ten plus x ten. It needs to be equal to x one plus x two plus x three, right? That's the flow. flow. Um, uh, don't you mean x zero? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, zero, yeah. one, two. Uh, <laughs> that's easier. Why is that objective the maximum of x zero plus x one plus x three? That should be two, right? How are we going zero from two, x yeah. one to x five to? Because the goal is to go go to t, right? Yeah. So we're gonna do. go to t. But you want to maximize this. This are the flow. This are not the capacity. So whatever flow that you send out it must be received by T. And, and you cannot send out four plus three plus three because at some point you're going to hit the bottleneck, right? These ones are going to actually prohibit you to send the maximum capacity out from S. Okay. So we're going to set up all these constraints so we, it's going to make more sense. So these are a set of few constraints. Is the max you can send out seven then? Because for S you have three, three, four, so that's ten, right? And then for T you have two and five. Well, the maximum you can, you can send out is ten, right? Oh, but I thought T could only accept seven though. Yeah. So that's another constraint. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Sure. Sure. But that's just one constraint. You have just set it just following that constraint. Uh huh. There are a lot more constraints. Actually. I, I, I get it. Yeah. Another very important constraint is, so it's kind of similar to this. Your flow needs to be conservative. Whatever send out must be received, right? So this this one can be considered as the conserv conservative constraint. Uh, flow conservative. Another very important conservative constraint is that whatever um, amount of or whatever number of units received by a node must be sent out by that unit, except at the start and the go, right? So for every other node, other constraints, and this is another type of flow conservative, but for nodes other than must be going out. It doesn't actually store anything. Yeah. It's, so you said that every flow that goes out must be received. I'm just wondering uh, if T is 7 and you're sending out 10, how can T receive the surplus that's 3, right? Wait. I, I'm just, I guess I'm just looking at T, the two incoming yeah. edges, 2 and 5. Yeah. Uh, so isn't that seven, and then the three outgoing edges for S are three, three, and four, so isn't that 10? Uh -huh. So isn't, don't you have three extra? No, I'm not sending out three, three, and four. Oh, okay, you're not. Those are oh, capacity. I, those are options, I got right. you. you can send out at most three, three, and four. I got well, you. I don't know how much I'm going to send out. That's my variable I'm trying to solve. Mm -hmm. right? That's the problem I'm trying to solve. So um, for conservative constraint, cons constraints, you have, Flow in equals flow out. Uh, for example, for for A, we have we have what? So for A, you have x two and x three coming into A. So we can formulate it x two plus x three. It must equal to x four, right? So that's the constraint for A, and we have also have for B, you have x1 equals 3 and 5. Two more. 
uh, for d, you got x4 coming into d plus x5 coming into d. It must be equal to x6 plus x8. Alright, that's for d. For e, you have x8 plus x7 plus We got four and five coming in, going out of nine and eight. Nine and eight plus six and eight. So, so one for every now. Is that is x one equals x three plus x five? Is that correct? Uh, it should be. Well, if it's not correct, you can come and correct it. I gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> well, for B, what, what do we have? X1 equals coming out X3 X three and X5. X X X yeah, okay, cool. okay. I'm not a computer, so I make mistakes. <laughs> you can come and correct me if you like. Um, so again, this is um, flow conservative for an, all the nodes other than S and T, right? S only produce and T only receives. Mm -hmm. um, so that's all the constraints, I think. That's all the constraints that we have. Stop it. So that's a linear programming, right? We have all the constraints uh, formulated as linear combinations of all the variables. Um, we have equal sign, greater than or smaller than. Lower bound, upper bound, lower bound, lower and upper bound. Uh, and we have linear objective function, very simple ones. So here is the bad news. I mean, solving this is going to take you forever. I mean, especially <laughs> if you have a lot many more variables than just 11 of them. Okay. Uh, this is a problem known to be MP hard. Um, even though not, uh, we, we aren't really in the chapter talking about um, complexity of the problems yet, but this is basically saying that the most efficient pro um, uh, program that you can write is going to be able to solve the problem in exponential time only. Okay, so this is so difficult that uh, solving a linear programming problem is guaranteed to be MP hard. Like, that means it's really difficult to solve. But this particular type of linear programming problem, especially maximum flow, has a very important property that you can actually use to solve it much, much more quickly. Okay, so we'll be talking about um, those tricks today, how to solve this problem in polynomial time in particular. But keep in mind that whenever you see a linear programming problem, it's typically really difficult to solve. Um, And even though I said that, but that doesn't mean it's most of the linear programming problems are not solvable. In fact, most of linear programming problems can be solved efficiently. Okay, so I'm actually contradicting myself, isn't it? I'm saying that the problems are really difficult, but and then the, the time complexity for solving them uh, typically in, in exponential time, right? So that's true. However, there's also certain so that's based on the time complexity, complexity analysis that we talked about earlier in the semester, which is based on what? Worst case scenario, right? So uh, in that regard, it has terrible, terrible time complexity, exponential time. On the other hand, um, there's this very famous algorithm called simplex, which can solve the problem really efficiently, almost polynomial time. Okay, I say almost because there are these pathological cases that will actually kill the approaches that you kill the algorithm, but that types of uh, problems really same. So in practice, you can actually formulate most of your problems 
even with thousands of variables, thousands of all of these X variables, and still being able to solve them in reasonable amount of time, maybe a few minutes to a few hours, uh, based on simplex. So, so depending on how we go, I mean, we might not really have time to go over simplex, but you should keep in mind that this is one of the, um, I would say, really bizarre problem that has really worked a really, really terrible time complexity in terms of the worst case scenario, right? But you have this, on the other hand, really efficient algorithm that no one knows really why that can solve this problem so, so efficiently. Um, so let's, let's move on and talk about how to solve this. Do you have any idea about how to solve this, even using brute force? Do we use the same table we did before to store in all the expenses? That that yeah, exactly. Well, we move on from there. Okay, so. I gotcha. Okay, different. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think one thing that you can try is by looking at this, right? Um, we kind of assume that all the capacity um, or age weights are integers. So you can start from where? by sending out one flow at a time, right? Sending out one flow, one flow, one flow, and see if it actually satisfies all the constraints. Of course, it's not going to maximize your capacity, but it can increase that amount little by little. So in that case, um, the combinations that you can try is going to be four plus three plus three, right? I thought the homework is not due today. What is this meeting? <laughs> It's Thursday. Oh, next Thursday. No, no, no this Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> 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 I'll be waiting late. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what are you doing? So one, that's one approach. Um, another approach is going to be the following approach that I was going to talk about. Um, let's see. This is based on the idea of residual graph. Remember the problem that when we try to actually construct the uh, strongly connected components, we take the graph and construct another graph, which is a reverse graph, right? And we perform a reverse graph and to find out where the source of the DAG is. And we use that to be um, basically the, the, the sink of the DAG that we're looking for in the original problem. We're going to do something very similar here. We're going to take this input graph and construct another, another graph called residual graph. This is basically a graph that um, encodes all the information about how much capacity is left that you can still send flow over. And in, in addition to that, you're going to actually encode information about how to cancel a flow. Okay? So this is very important that whenever, whatever flow that you send over to the network, you can actually cancel it and, and revise your decision that way. Okay, so uh, let me erase this. It's a very general definition about linear programming. Going to be just 
our residual graph. Okay, initially that is just our graph. Right, this is our G. Graph. But for the sake of completeness, I'm going to copy that graph to the left. So it's easier to visualize. Yes. So the idea is very simple. So since we're sending flow, and uh, the flow is going to be basically a path connecting from S to T. That's, that's our definition of one flow. And we're going to send out many flows, right, um, from, from S to T. So the algorithm process is the following. It's basically extracting the path from G star or residual graph. As long as there's a path connecting from S to T, we can basically augment the flow into the graph on the right. Okay. And we keep doing this until there's no path remaining from this residual graph. Okay, so that's how we terminate. Um, and the process can be arbitrary, so it can be any path. Okay. And we'll come down to the, the problem of that later, but basically the idea is that you take a path. Um, so let's take the path of Again, arbitrary S to B to D, maybe to E, and then to T. Okay, so path number one S to E to D to E, and then to T. How much flow can I sample for this path? Two, right? Two. Yeah, because from. Two. No. It's one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because uh, the bottleneck is. From ET, like, that's right. E to E. Okay. So you can, you can really send more than one unit. Um, so this is flow one. Okay. And, um, okay. So. Does it matter which bottleneck we look at? Because B to D is one, and D to E is no, one. No, because it's confirmed by the path that you pick. Yeah. It's always, I mean, since we try to maximum flow, we also try to maximum the flow of the path. And it's going to be constrained by the bottleneck. Yeah. Right? Um, but the, the order in which the bottleneck appears doesn't matter. As long as it's there, that's what we have to, that's the constraint, right? Right, right, right. Okay. So the first flow we send is going to be um, x1 equals 1 x5 equals 1, x8 equals 1, then x10 equals 1. Okay. And just to make sure, we can use all three uh, paths uh, at the same time, right? Like x1, x, x0, x1, and right. x2. Um, at, at, at the end, right? Like that's the, the end, objective. Of course, at the end. Mm -hmm. At the end. At the end. Right now, we're just iterating through this every time you, you extract the path. Okay. So here's the important part. Once you have the path, once you augment the graph with the flow, right? This is still pretty straightforward. What you want to do is, you know, I'm going to modify your residual graph so that the capacity of the graph is actually reduced by the flow, right? So right now, 
um, instead of three here, the capacity becomes two. And here's the important part. You actually have created another flow, another connection, in the reverse direction, that allows you to cancel your previous flow. So this is basically saying that I can send another flow from B to S of unit one to cancel my flow that I sent from S to B. Okay? So I'm adding this extra link back so that I can cancel my flow. Since my decision is arbitrary, I just make this, this decision that I'm going to send the flow over this arbitrary path, right? This might not be optimal mm -hmm. at all. Right, so I need to basically have a way to um, modify my decision, to change my decision like this. So that's why I'm adding this path. So I'm actually adding path, uh, this extra link for all the paths. So are you trying to cancel the bottleneck then by just sending that one path? Uh, no. Okay. okay. Well, we'll, we'll, you'll see that later. Um, what's the number one, one that I was saying? What's the capacity of this? This is one actually, right? Um, so that becomes zero. And this is my canceling flow. Okay. Same thing here. And that's zero. And that becomes four. Can already see that as long as we have a path, now we can actually look at this argument, um, residual graph again, and try to extract another path, right? And through the path, you're going to reduce the capacity, and you're going to flip the direction of the edges, or adding more capacity to this reverse <coughs> edges, right? Eventually, you are going to basically cut off S from T. In that case, there's no path anymore. You, can, you cannot send any flow anymore. And at that point, you actually find the optimal solution. Um, what's the next path that you want to try? Just call out something. So this must be coming from S, right? To T. So let's try something bigger. So one is kind of pathetic, and it's <laughs> going to take us forever. So four looks good, five, four, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, good. So C to E to T, that will give us four, right? Nice. Nice. Um, so our X zero is going to be four. X seven is going to be four. X ten is going to be one plus four, which is five, right? So at this point, you can also check whether it, the, 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 the flow is consistent, right? For E, you have a flow coming from, from D to E, mm. right? And another flow from C to E. If you put them together, you send out this, this five, right? So what should we do with this uh, residual graph? Well, in this case, we're sending back four, sending back Four, sending back one plus four, right? And we change our capacity. It's all down to zero. There's nothing, no more capacity left. For this as well, zero. And that's going to be five plus four, one. Okay? X or is that a four where you, you had right, right behind you actually? This one? Uh, behind you. Uh, X one? seven equals X in red. Oh, oh that's so four. four. Yeah. Oh, that's a terrible four. <laughs> Looks like an X. Anything else? 
You can do S V D C E T S B D D and then you go back to C. C oh that's nice. Okay. Great. <laughs> S B D S C E D Q E and T. Yes. Follow any of the red? S B D. Yeah. S B A D T. No, D is supposed to go to C. Oh, D to C. D to C. Yeah. You can't get out of C. Well, you can go to E. It's still not following any of the red edges. Well, let's try this, right? This is also pretty big. S A D T, and then we'll see what happens after that. Do you understand what's going on? What can we do now? So this Word this is going to have capacity of two. 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 Okay. Um, we'll flow over this. Go over this. It's not very interesting, but you're looking at Casey Abbott. Like a reasonable path to to choose anyway. Um, so in that case, we will have backlink of two. Especially the conservative constraints, right? Um, for B, uh, this is whatever that we are not labeling. We have zero capacity, like zero flow. So X3 has zero. Anything else has zero. That has zero. No flow. Um, that's it. Right. So you have for B, you have one. So three capacity, three units. Is that right? And then you have one going down and another two going direct to T. Right? And for E, you have simply a five. So that's the solution. How you do it? Any questions so far? Why did you write down zero? Because there was no flow. Yeah, there's no flow. flow coming back. Okay. Yeah, initially they're all zero. Can you explain one more time what is the point of the, uh, you know, um, reversing, it. reversing it? I mean, how, how does that work? Well, because we're not using any of them at this example. Mm -hmm. So basically, it allows you to actually still sending the flow over the red edges. Yeah. You're sending the flow over the red edges. I mean, in reality, you cannot do that, right? If you look at the picture on the right, you, there's no link pointing back. That is basically conceptually saying that you can cancel the flow. Cancel the flow that you sent earlier by going through the red edges. Oh, so that, that means that we're going to get our final final answers on the left side of us? Like yeah. Oh, so okay. I was trying to see whether or not we can find an example that um, okay. will allow us to do that. But we're just doing such a good job that we only sent three flows and <laughs> yeah. a optimal solution. Um, I will give you another example, and maybe you can work on it, and hopefully we can find um, a 
better understanding of what's going on. So I'm going to give you basically the same graph, but different capacities. So you can work on this, but before we do that, um, and to be better answer your question, I guess this this classical of this very simple graph. S A to one, right? No, no. No, oh, okay, okay. Don't have yes. any oh. Path. So the only path you can pick is S B following this red age. Okay. A and to T. S B A T of capacity one. Right? So this is saying what? I'm going to have this. actually changing here is that since I send the flow from B to A, I use this capacity. So the capacity of that went again down from 1 to 0. And I have capacity to cancel this flow. So 
I'm going to have one year. <laughs> okay. So what is that path exactly? What is the flow? The flow is now going through the zigzag directions. The flow is super simple. It's basically going from S to A to T, and from S to B to T. So in this case, you have a way to actually correct your answer. The first path that you pick is horrible, right? It went through this really the longest route that you can pick, instead of going from S to A to T directly. Um, if you do that, you're already on the right track. You don't have to actually correct anything. Um, so this is basically saying that even if you did something wrong in the beginning or during the process, having this red agents allowing you to allowing you to cancel the flow that you sent earlier um, makes this algorithm much, much more flexible and allow the algorithm to actually find the optimal solution. So if you look at this, right, you're basically sending the flow from S to T. That's why the capacity is zero, same from B to T. And you're not sending anything at all from A to B. That's why the capacity is still one. Right? So yeah, let's work on this for maybe five minutes. And then we can take a break. Is that the same? Where you have the zero in red pointing up and then the one in blue pointing down, is that the equivalent of the zero in blue pointing uh, down and then the, the one in red pointing up? There's no difference between the, and then, it, then the ones to the left of that. This has one, that has zero. Exactly. That, and then that means you're sending a blow from A to B. But is that equivalent to S to B? Do you see how zero blue and then one red? That this one? Look. Yeah, yeah. Is that the equivalent? Because zero is blue in that one, in that pair, uh -huh. and zero is red in the other pair, and right. then one is red in that pair, and then one so is blue. So this is basically saying that you already sent a okay. unit to blue. But I'm just saying, are those two equivalent? Like, there's no difference between those two. I don't know what you mean. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. It's all good. yeah. Uh, well, uh, basically, it, it looks to me like you can travel from S to B or A to B, and there's no difference between S -S zero pointing up and one pointing down. I, mean, I don't know, it's, I guess it's hard for to explain a little bit, but mm, it yeah. looks to me like uh, I was just questioning if those are identical to each other, uh, despite zero being blue and then zero being red and then one being blue. Well, they make different things. Well, I, they're different things, but I'm saying is that they allow you to do the, the, the same thing to travel uh, from A to B, or B to A, or S to B, or B to S. I'm still not sure. Okay, let's go, forget, forget it, forget it. <laughs> so basically, this is the same as, so if you think about a flow, right? You have a flow from S to B, and it going up to A, and then going down to T. Mm -hmm. That's one flow. And you should actually think about this physically as sending a flow, right? There's a reaper coming in that direction. There's also an, another reaper coming from S to A and then down to B and then to T. That's, that's the two flow that we're talking about here. Yeah, but if, if you swap those two, would it be the same graph? Swap? If you swap that notes? zero, that red zero and that blue one with <coughs> that blue zero and that red <laughs> one, and send it the, the, no, the, the pair, you, the, if you're looking at each of each as a, each as a pair, you swap that pair. Is the There's graph two one. pairs? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you take that pair and then you put it where the other pair is, S to B. Uh, I, I guess I'm just saying. Sorry, I don't want to like take up too much time. No, no. What if you have the practice? Okay, okay. Right. I'm saying if you take this right here and put it here, and then you take no, this here and put it. Well, I'm just saying, is it? Is like, there no difference between the graph? I was saying that. Instead of this, you have one here. Yeah. Just didn't you? So you swap these, but like, is it the same graph? I guess it's a different flow. It's a, it's a different flow, but does it have the same properties as the previous graph? Yeah. 
Oh, it doesn't. It's, it's different now. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so if you're talking about a single path, so that means right? That for a single that path, you're just basically sending a flow and trying to maximize three. the flow no, that you're sending four, right? along the path. But well, we don't have to worry about You don't about have to worry about the yeah, um, four, right? Because three comes in, but I want to return four. No, three comes in and you send back three. Well, that is back four if you know you sent back three. Well, no, no, no. In that case, you're doing something, right? If you're sending two units along the path. For like A, SB. the two units coming in, and the three units going out. Yeah, this one is a mistake. So okay. in that sense, also so it's yeah. yeah. So then you send back three along this, and you subtract three from all these. So let me do okay. So let me get this right. This is basically mm -hmm. three. So it's like saying, I feel like I'm saying, like, hey, you guys, I got three. So you're saying you got three, and then you're I got saying you can't send three. And then and then I subtract the yeah, the so that becomes a two. Okay. And this becomes a. A zero. zero. And this becomes a seven. Yes. And this becomes a five. Sure. From three? Uh, seven. Four. Sorry. Four, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's not clicking in my head, but I, I, I can't I think I get the idea. So uh, what should be the example that I try? Path number one? S B A D T. S B A D T. Mm. <laughs> and that's going to have capacity of three, right? Yeah. Sent three units along that path. Three, three. This from B to A. ADT. Oh, no, not you. <laughs> ADT. 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 S A. D T. That's the same part I, I was going to choose. Oh, okay. <laughs> S A D T. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Flow along those P. Uh, 
pages. Um, Can you get from S to A if there's a zero? Oh, I can get to A? Shoot. Oh, uh, okay, 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 okay. Too bad. <laughs> is, any, is there any path that I can travel? Not now. Not really. Okay, let's try another one then. <laughs> Two. The bottom one? satisfy the constraints, this is easy, right? We make sure that the, the flow that we send out is never going to be more than the capacity along the path, right? So the sum is not going to be bigger than um, the capacity. Um, These constraints are basically satisfied, satisfied by what? The constraint of flow conservative. The path that you pick, the way that you assign the, um, the, the the flow uniformly across the entire path, that satisfies you that constraint. Right. So that's just kind of automatically satisfied because of the property that you, you did. When you pick a path, 
the sided flow uniformly along the path. So let's take a break. Uh, let's come back in 